Okay. Uh, now, um, I began talking about the title of my talk, which is an update. And the title listed in the program was what the animals tried to tell us. So let me go through this very quickly since I've already said this to you. And my work has documented the fact that the science is not only complicated, it has been manipulated. And I think that Martin Paul is going to address some of that uh, when he speaks. When it comes to the type of, types of evidence that we have, I indicated we had three major types because public policy has to act based on uncertain and incomplete information. So we have exposure and modeling studies, then we have animal studies. And the animal studies are intended to predict and prevent harm in, in humans. And keep in mind that every agent that we know that causes cancer in humans will produce it in animals when adequately studied. And finally, we have epidemiology. And I am both a toxicologist and epidemiologist. So I have to tell you, we should never rely or insist on epidemiologic evidence before taking steps to develop precautionary policies. Otherwise, we're treating people like they're in an experiment, often with no controls. So epidemiology confirms the past. Now, the spectrum of electromagnetic fields extends all the way from the 50 Hertz, which is powering your light, to the 36 quadrillion and more uh, that is in the cosmic and X-ray spectrum. What we are particularly concerned about here is the cell phone Wi-Fi spectrum. And here, 5G falls somewhere around here. And we have scientific information that 5G increases permeability, can accelerate cell growth. So the question is, what evidence do we need to take precautionary steps? Now, when we talk about 5G, I want to make sure that you understand that there's not one size fits all. In fact, the specs for 5G are still being written as I speak. In the United States today, in some football stadiums, you can get 5G so that you have the opportunity to simultaneously take a video, beam it to a friend, watch the game, eat your popcorn, all at the same time. But it's working at 700 megahertz as the carrier. And it means that 5G antennas have to have within them 3G and 4G because most of the devices in the stadium are in fact 3G and 4G. Very few people have 5G ready devices. The high frequency cells are being used right now for some environmental monitoring and frankly for surveillance activities in a number of cities. And finally, the millimeter wave of 26 gigahertz and above will be used for some other connections. The question we have to ask ourselves, among many, is, is this a public health risk? And the answer, in my opinion, and that of Dr. Paul and others, is yes, it is. And we have evidence that it could be that it is a risk. And we'll talk about some of that. But before doing that, I'd like to share with you this schemata that shows you the different aspects that we can look at when we're thinking about what a signal is. A signal is many complex things. It has frequency, it has power, it has beats or pulse per second, it has power density, it has polarity, information content. All of those different things characterize what a signal is. And it's very um, easy to confuse people by not clarifying what aspect of what you're uh, referring to when you present it. More importantly, we know from new research just published, supported by the American Cancer Society and carried out at Yale, that genetic factors such as single nucleotide SNPs make a difference in whether or not people are more or less susceptible to certain environmental exposures, in particular cell phone radiation. So all of these factors influence the re biological response that you get. And yet we very seldom will hear about a clarification of what exactly was, was the signal continuous? Was it disruptive? Was it uh, altered? Uh, what was the power density? Uh, what, um, what aspects of exposure uh, were controlled? If you look here, what I'm showing you is that in terms of power density, which is measured in volts per meter 
on the y-axis, you see that through a four second phone call, you get these huge swings in power density over time. And it's thought that the constant change in peak exposure is what makes the biological impact. So it's not the power, but the pulse. And as Dr. Cindy Russell has said, pulse is poison. And it's the repeated exposure to these pulses that is important. So now let's take a step back and ask, what has not changed since the 20th century? Well, interestingly, radar ranges were first introduced uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Women didn't like the idea of cooking with radar, so they changed the name to microwave. That is the origin of the term microwave, by the way. The original cell phones were uh, weighed about two and a half pounds, cost at that time $3,900, which would be about $9,000 today. You see Maxwell Smart there with his shoe phone. But, and they were sold at the time when gas sold for about $1.30 a gallon. Those things have changed in some way, but what has not changed is the standards that we use to test phones today are the same standards that have been used since 1996. The radar range didn't go too well. It became the microwave oven. I want to share with you this statement from the FDA website. There is no pre-market safety testing for phones. There could be, that is their authorizing statute could allow it, but the FDA website says they do not review the safety of cell phones. And the FDA website further says, and I quote, they, can, they have the authority to take action if cell phones are shown to emit radio frequency energy at a level that is hazardous to the user. In that case, they could require them, user manufacturers to repair, replace, or recall the phone. They could do this, but they are not doing this. And I submit uh, that they are missing in action and have been, unfortunately, for some time. So another thing that hasn't changed is that the methods for testing phones are based on this guy. We call him Sam. It's short for standard anthropomorphic mannequin. He's got a big empty head and we pour homogenous fluid into it. He doesn't talk a lot because we only measure what happens during a six minute phone call. One thing that will never change is that the base of all of our cells is DNA, in the, in the nucleus of every cell. We have uh, DNA, this exquisite double helix of nucleotide bonds, and that is what holds us all together. Now, identical twins don't have precisely the same DNA. Although they come from one egg that splits in two, they are uh, shown here with these methylation patterns that are uh, fluoresce green from chromosomes that have been identified in identical twins from studies that have been done in Scandinavia. But look at the same twins at age 50. They do not look like they're even related to one another. So as identical twins age, their chromosomes begin to look less similar. And what this is telling us is that the environment is critically important. Genes may give us the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. As an example of that, here are some more recent studies that have been done in Denmark, also with identical twins, where they looked, if you see here the pattern on the top, this, these are the young identical twins, and this is showing a great deal of correlation between their chromosomal activation. But by the time the same twins are older, you see the spread here. And whether you know any science or, at all, this is clearly showing again that over time, even identical twins stop looking like they're related to one another. Environmental factors ranging from stress to exposure to chemicals to a whole host of things make a huge difference in the health of identical twins. With respect to that DNA, Henry Lai and Vijay Singh developed a brilliant and innovative assay and in the in a real wor fair world, they would receive the Nobel Prize in Medicine for what this work was. 
They showed that you could take the DNA and unravel it and it would form a tail seen here as it starts to unravel or here. This DNA unraveling occurred with the equivalent of 1600 chest x-rays. This DNA unraveling occurred with one day of mobile phone exposure at a permissible level at the time. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all doomed because we have lots of repair. That's one of the benefits. But it is important to recognize that while there are important differences between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, seen here, ionizing radiation is, is faster with more energy. It can break chemical bonds directly. But non-ionizing radiation with its lower frequency and lower energy and thermal effects also can in fact damage DNA. And I'm going to show you why and how we know that from studies completed most recently at the US National Toxicology Program that have been carried out there, but many other studies that have been carried out around the world also show this damage to DNA, this increase of reactive oxygen species and the damage to male and female health. Here is one of the studies from earlier in this century the EU Reflex Project, originally led by Franz Edelkofer. It was a four-year project in 12 uh, groups in seven European countries, well over $10 million of funding. And they were able to show a change in the structure of the DNA and the function of the genes that were damaged. So you got from intermittent exposures, you got breaks in a single and double strand DNA breaks, and you got them in human fibroblasts. Most interestingly, you got them in stem cells, but not in mature cells. So that indicates as an example, the further complexity of what we're talking about here. One needs to talk, specify the type of cell, the age, if you will, and uh, uh, many other components. This study done in two, 20, 2006 was immediately subject to war games. So a lot of scientific uncertainty was manufactured about it. Igor Belyaev, about a, a year earlier, had reached the same conclusion, looking at a number of different studies that he had done at specific DNA repair genes, 53 beta and uh, uh, H2AX foci in human cells. Looking at human cells, he showed DNA damage. And with the GSM, which was then the most common exposure, he also showed that some frequencies damage all cell types, while other frequencies only damage a few. And again, we should never let the complexity of the science, which is real, prevent us from formulating reasonable public policy. Now, what we can say, again from earlier studies, is that Exposure to radio frequency below the current safety limits has caused damage synergistically. And if you look at the graph on the right, you see that the black is the control cells that were exposed to a known chemical carcinogen. We know it causes uh, cancer in animals, ethyl nitrosiurea. And then when you added that known carcinogen to exposure to cell phone radiation, you got an accelerated effect, a doubled effect or more with a low amount of radio frequency radiation, which is consistent with the Ramazzini findings that Dr. Melnick is going to be talking to you about later. Now the NTP study was requested in 1999. Dr. Melnick is going to go over it in detail, but again, I want to just stress the summary of it was that they found statistically significant increases in cancer and borderline significant increases in cancer and hyperplasia and dysplasia in multiple organs. And they also showed DNA damage in both rats and mice, the male rat and the female and male mouse. And nonetheless, for reasons that many of us do not understand, the FDA has rejected the findings of the NTP as not relevant to humans. Well, they point out, for example, that the animals weren't making phone calls. No, that's actually not quite what they say. They say that the whole body exposure was not relevant to phone exposure. 
Well, I, I, frankly, we object. That is, in fact, what people are getting all the time with phones in your pocket, phones close to your body, and it's proximity to the body that is the issue. We know there's tumor promoting effects, um, and this is from a number of different studies have shown this. And it may be that there are metabolic changes, changes in permeability that could explain it. But in the interest of time, I'm going to try, I'm going to skip over this slide of the DNA damage that was published by the NTP, because I know that Dr. Melnick will discuss it in, in more detail. But you can see a clear dose response in the very top one here. And this is a CDMA exposure for the mouse frontal cortex. That's the part of the brain. This is suggesting that in fact, the brain in the mouse and perhaps in us is uniquely sensitive to this radiation. Now, when it comes to sperm, humans need a lot of sperm to make a healthy baby. They are produced at the rate of 90,000 uh, a minute. And in order to succeed, they have to swim the equivalent of from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Uh, it is truly survival of the fittest. Some people have asked, and as I've said in my TEDx talk that I suggest you may like to look at, the reason you need so many sperm is that they do not know how to ask for directions. But what we do know from really brilliant work that's been carried out by uh, uh, Kasari in uh, 2018, recently published, is that we have multiple exposures the body does not differentiate. We know the highest exposure is from the cell phone. There's no debate about that. But we know that depending on proximity to a tower, depending on your use of ovens, depending on whether you actually keep a laptop on the lap, which no one should do anymore, and, and where and how many routers you may be exposed to, all of that influences the development of LSH and FSH, the development of pituitary hormones which in, flow, in, in turn influence lytic cells and have an effect on the quantity and quality of the sperm that's produced, including that reactive <laughs> oxygen species can be stimulated by this exposure and that those can directly damage sperm cells. Now, the effects have been shown to influence a whole cascade of proteins seen here with ligand protein receptors. And these proteins can either tell cells to die, apoptosis, or they can influence the development of cancer. So again, it's the structure or the function of DNA that can be affected by cell phone radiation. So that even though DNA does, uh, cell phone radiation does not have strength enough to break the basic nucleotide bonds, it can damage DNA. And it can do it through a variety of mechanisms that have been suggested here in this work uh, by, by Kessari, including gene activation of, by free radicals that are formed, as well as interfering with calcium uh, channels, as you will hear from Dr. Paul. Now, when it comes to experiments that have been done with, with mammalian sperm, it's important to realize we actually have a, we have a lot of data here. It's not often just spoken about, but we do. And one study that I participated in with colleagues involved looking at the effect of cell phone radiation directly on testis. And the slides are from an animal, but I want to direct your attention to this visualization here. You will see that the highest exposure goes into the testis. That is the hot source of highest exposure when a phone is in the pocket. And this is based on anatomically based modeling developed by Claudio Fernandez and Alvaro de Salas at Porto Alegre in, in Brazil. The control slide here shows you nice borders and cell walls, and the exposed show an absence of that integrity. Again, suggesting that one of the consequences of this exposure is to damage membranes, damage integrity. Again, uh, this is a a uh, more recent publication showing effects on mitochondria. And again, the black bars are the exposed germline, germ cells, and the white is the control. So over time, the white will increase because there's going to be damage from time. Sperm are not meant to survive outside of the body for long. 
But what you see here is a st very statistically significant difference with certain of these genetic alterations in sperm that are exposed to cell phone radiation. Damage to the mitochondrial superoxides. Mitochondria is the engine of the cell. A very significant effect. All of these slides and all of the references to them are embedded in the slides. So I we can share those with you. This is again an increase in reactive oxygen species uh, shown in the germ cells here with again, over time, you see a greater effect. But if you look at, at the uh, bars here, you'll see that the exposure to um, radio frequency radiation here dramatically increases the effect. And the weight of the testis is also affected in this new study from, from Houston. And again, you see the control cells here at the top and you look at the exposed at, at, at the very bottom and you see again, the loss of integrity. And over time, the mouse testis, the exposed testis is significantly, has significantly less weight. And that's, that's important because of course, you want to have the healthiest organ that you can in order to, to ensure reproductive health. Other studies have looked at vitality and motility. And again, not surprisingly, over time, this is the sham. That is to say, they just were allowed to sit there for time not much happens, but when you get exposure here in the red, you see a substantial decrement in vitality, motility, and motility meaning the ability to swim. So if a sperm can't swim, it's not gonna succeed in fertilizing anything. And these are serious problems and they're so serious that all fertility clinics now around the world recommend that men having problems impregnating their partners get their phones and other devices off their bodies. That's standard advice.